This is Rob Morse of the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. I'm reminding you that this podcast is one of the many good ones on the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out the other podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. Welcome to Unload and Show Clear, the podcast about all things IDPA. And now, here's your host, a man for whom getting stuck in traffic was the only thing worse than sticking around for day one of Nationals, Lloyd Bailey. Welcome to another episode of Unload and Show Clear. This is a podcast about the men and women who compete in IDPA. International Defensive Pistol Association. Now, I've been attending IDPA matches since 2011, and over the years, I've met some really amazing people thanks to this sport. Ignore all the colorful jerseys and the sponsor logos, and underneath, you're going to find everyday men and women who volunteer their time and their effort and spend their hard-earned dollars on travel, match fees, and gear to make this sport great. And today, you're going to meet another one of these awesome people. But first, I want to thank today's sponsor. All right, before we get started, I want to tell you about GlockTriggers.com. Recently, at a sanctioned IDPA match, I went to the line, I went to load and make ready, and the little dingus thing flew out of my trigger. Just completely flew out of the gun. So I had to scramble and shoot the, the stage with a backup gun. So now I'm in the market for a new trigger. And guess what I found? GlockTriggers.com. Love them or hate them, the one thing that you know about Glock pistols is their reliability. They're out of the box, to the range, to the match, absolutely reliable. And it's what makes them popular with competitors like myself, law enforcement, military, and responsible citizens. But the one drawback is that stock trigger. Well, Jeff Wilson and the people at Glock Triggers They ask themselves, how can we make this better? But how can we do it while maintaining reliability? Using stock parts as their foundation, they refine the interaction of the metal parts in the trigger kit to give you smoother take up, a cleaner break, and reduced over travel without sacrificing safety or reliability. That's important. Recommended and used by people like Bob Vogel, Travis Haley, and Ken Hackathorn, Glock Triggers, Custom trigger kits come with a lifetime warranty and a 30-day satisfaction guarantee. Check out the Edge, the Vogel, the Skimmer, the Guardian, or the Hackathorn trigger system and use the promo code from this podcast, USC20, and save 20% off your entire order. GlockTriggers.com, the highest quality drop-in trigger system for your Glock. Our special guest today is Aaron Brols from Lexington, Kentucky. Aaron, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what you do for a living there in Lexington. Um, I am a project manager for Davis H. Elliott, which is actually a construction company focusing on uh, electrical services. My my position is uh, low-voltage data cabling, uh, fiber optic cabling, CAT6, basically network infrastructure type stuff. Uh, I kind of came to that after spending 22 and a half years in the military and in the, basically in the communications field. And uh, I'm not from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm actually originally from Joliet, Illinois. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for your service, by the way. What branch? Uh, U.S. Navy. Very good. What? Um, so did the interest in guns, did that develop after your military service or was that something, did you grow up around guns? How did that, uh, how did that interest develop? Kind of honestly didn't grow up around guns too much. Being in Illinois behind enemy lines, it's kind of difficult <laughs> right. being honest with you there. Um, <laughs> military, Navy, not so much guns, but, uh, towards the end of my career, I, I did do two deployments to Iraq, um, working with some SEAL teams and doing some combat operations. And, Honestly, what was funny is I, I took a number of classes with them and thought I could shoot a pistol kind of good. Rifle, I was much more comfortable. And honestly, post-Navy service, I carried a gun for quite a while. And what drew me to uh, just competitive shooting, let alone IDPA, is knowing that I can actually pull that gun and shoot it well. And I quickly found out that I was no good at shooting a pistol. <laughs> So what was the introduction to, to IDPA? How did you, uh, how did you hear about it? How did you get involved? And what do you remember of that first, that first IDPA match? 
Well, I had first heard about competitive shooting with IPSC. To be honest with you, I'd never even heard of USPSA or even IDPA. And when I moved to Kentucky, one of the reasons my wife and I moved to Kentucky was honestly really good gun rights. And, mm -hmm. and I heard that Central Kentucky was a really good area for shooting sports. And I actually found out from a coworker that my local club hosted IDPA matches. And I saw it. He's like, hey, why don't you come on down to the club? They're having an IDPA match. I was like, sounds great. And I show up on the happened that weekend, happened to be the classifier. And it was the of original course. classifier. <laughs> yeah. And it was raining. <laughs> I don't know how many people I've had on the show that that was their introduction. They showed up for their first match and it was a classifier. <laughs> I didn't uh, know any rules. I got procedurals. I had magazine that jammed. It, I, I, everything absolutely went wrong, but somehow or another, I did qu classify novice, I believe. <laughs> and yet you went back. I did. I did. So after the frustration of a classifier, and I remember that frustration very well, um, you, you still decided to, to go back what did that, that experience motivate you to do? Did you, I mean, did you suddenly decide, all right, I'm going to get better at this sport or, I mean, what did you take away from that classifier? What were the lessons you learned? Exactly what I said earlier. Uh, what I learned was, is I couldn't shoot a pistol and, and <laughs> in, in all seriousness, I had been carrying now I'd been out of the military a few years, been carrying a gun on a daily basis. And I realized in a serious note that I, I was not a good pistol shooter. And it was, it was very funny because after that, I had, I had run into a, a fellow competitive shooter at a gun store looking at a gun. And I, I, I was just looking at different pistols. And he said, well, what's your goal? He goes, is your, is your goal to become a master? And I was like, oh, I kind of looked at him like, oh, you know what? You kind of know what I'm talking about, you know, competitive <laughs> pistol shooting. And I said, no, no, there, there's no possible way I could ever become a master. And he just kind of laughs, laughs and he's like, why? I'm like, I, I'm just never been that good at hand sports, baseball, football. That, that was not my thing. I'm like, I just want to feel good, confident with a pistol if I'm carrying it around. And he's like, no, you're looking at it all wrong. You need to dive in with both feet and go for it. And you can, anybody can make master if they put a, a little bit of effort, focus, and time and energy and instruction into it. I said, I walked away from that conversation saying, you know, you know, may, maybe I'll give this a try. Maybe, maybe that guy I saw at the gun store was right that if I actually put some effort into it and I can actually get better. And you're now a master in ESP, SSP, and CCP. That's what correct. Did it, what did it take? What did you do to get from the frustration of that first classifier to get to master class like this stranger at the gun store said that you you could do for for me it took a lot of focus uh i i kind of wandered around in idpa I, I is what i would call it for about three quarters of a year almost a full year before i took it i would say took it seriously got some instruction from a, a friend who's the match director of my local club has some good experience and then i really started taking it seriously and it wasn't until after the 2015 world championship which i first time shooting in a not first time major actually i had two majors before that but first time shooting at a, a national level competition but it was ccp and i walked away with first place marksman nice. and it was after that match that i really really took it seriously and i'll never forget at the award ceremony joyce wilson is holding my the trophy, which was this glass reverse etched obelisk thing. And uh, she said, you know, Aaron, you're the first ever CCP marksman world champion. Nice. <laughs> and it, it really, I will tell you, it really hit me that, you know, wow, I, I've achieved something, you know, in my, in my head at that time was, Ooh, marksman. It was great, but it, it was an achievement and it, it really truly meant something to me. And I, I think it really sparked an interest to focus on it uh, even more. Cool. That was in, that was at the uh, Worlds 2015? That was Worlds 2015. My first match I shot was in 2015 at the Ides of March in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. I remember I, that match. <laughs> I think, uh, I, I think, because matter of fact, I think that was Mandy Bachman's first sanctioned match as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to that match specifically to get points for nationals. I, I went to that match in the Carolina Cup. And I think I applied for the world championship with like two points <laughs> <laughs> and I got in. 
<laughs> did you have to shoot it all in one day? I did. And it was, oh. it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the Ides of March or the IDPAs of March. What did they call it? And it was, it rained all week before that match. And it, it was, was horrible. There was one of the bays was like three feet underwater. It was great. Yep. Yep. That was, uh, the Lawrence's, uh, uh the standard stage. Standard stage. They exactly. Sent Ash, they sent their son Ashton out to get the, uh, the targets and hip waders. Boots. Yep, yep. I remember that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. That was the match. Very cool. What is, uh, what is your favorite division at this point? What, uh, what are you competing in most often and, and what gun are you using? Uh, typically these days I'm, I'm shooting mostly ESP. Uh, I shot CCP almost solid for two years and I've shifted over to ESP uh, and starting last year, all last year, full season. And then now I'm shooting a, a Walther's, uh, typically the PPQ, uh, M2 five inch, um, or gotcha. a Q5 match is my backup. Nice. Um, so talk about after worlds, talk about, share with us an experience from one of those, uh, well, not even, let's, let's go all the way back to your first one. Share with us an experience from one of those sanctioned matches. I will tell you that I did March that very first match. It was our very <laughs> first stage. And it, what what's funny about this is it, and it's not, <laughs> it's more pitiful for another shooter, but <laughs> there was the really wide bays and there was one of them where there were two stages on in one bay mm -hmm. and a shooter on the other squad uh, clearly broke the 180, and it was an SO from our stage that was on the left saw it, and this was their first. It was literally our first stage, their first stage, um, and he was the first shooter, and he got <laughs> DQ'd, and he argued about it. He was throwing his bag, and he's you know trying to plead his case that he had driven uh, about 700 miles with another guy to come to the match, <laughs> and he came there just for this and gets DQ'd on the on the first stage, and I felt bad for him, but. What it did, I mean, I am sitting there, my first match, first stage, like, holy smokes, what did I get myself into? If, if it's that easy to break the 180 and get DQ'd, am, am, I, really, am I really ready for this? It, right. It really put, the, put fear in me. It really did. I, I will tell you, SOing and even as a competitor watching other shooters, one of the big things that I have learned from shooting IDP, which was honestly really good, is that it is, it's easy to make a mistake. There's a lot of people who criticize, oh, you know, you, you see somebody shot themselves in a leg at home while cleaning their gun or, or injured someone in their home with a gun. And, you know, you go to these matches and you see the different obstacles and different challenges that are presented to you. And these are people who are trained and, and go to matches and do it regularly and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, no, you know, we haven't had anybody hurt, <laughs> but it happened. And it really shows you that in a stressful environment, that's, you know, people talk about IDP, is it training? Is it not training? And, and I think it, anything under stress helps you learn and you learn how to deal with stress on, you know, not under fire, but stress while performing. And that that's really what I saw at those moments that said, you know, this is, although I'm uncomfortable, it's a good uncomfortable, that uncomfortable feeling makes me want to learn how to, how to perform under that pressure. How long after you got started did you did you get involved in working as a safety officer? Yeah, that's that's an interesting and depressing for me <laughs> at times because I felt like I was excelling. I was I was doing really well. I was improving. I I think I would classified marksman, maybe even sharpshooter at that time. And then I started SOing because I really wanted <laughs> to learn the rules. Everybody told me, well, mm -hmm. if you want to learn the rules, become an SO. And right. uh, my my person, I would say, it has been my mentor since I started, said, you know, you also get to see so many other shooters, quite frankly, what they do wrong. And you can also pick up things that they do right. And you can use that to your benefit. And But the downside of that is it took me about six months to get my shooting back because the stress of trying to SO people while shooting myself just tanked my scores. It was, right. it was, it was atrocious. It was just horrible. I, I would go to sanctioned matches and say, oh, this is so great to just sit back and literally do nothing but paste. <laughs> and and <laughs> right. now I have that, have that opportunity to just be a competitor. And quite frankly, now I feel I'm on the opposite side of it. Now I, I tend to tend to find myself getting a little bit lazy mentally because I'm not so involved as, uh -huh. as an SO running the shooters. I am constantly, I, I, I and a people, my, my teammates and friends will laugh at me that I will, try to keep up with them with the timer. And I'm basically rehearsing the stage while I'm SOing 
but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to break it apart and find all the little things that I can improve on before I go to shoot. And I go to a major match, I don't have that opportunity anymore. And right. I find myself being a slightly a bit lazy, uh, and it's cost me at a few matches where I didn't do a really thorough walkthrough uh, sheepdog. And last year, one shot cost me a lot. And it wasn't actually last year, it was the year before. And it cost me a lot. And that's what I find. And I have to catch myself and remember that I still have to do that thorough walkthrough. So you're now the state coordinator for Kentucky. How did that come about? Well, you, you know, I saw the notice going out that they were going to start doing state coordinators and Kentucky was on that list. And our, our area coordinator had sent out an email and I, I had talked to people about it locally. And I said, you know, there's uh, obviously we can all admit in IDPA it's not perfect. And, right. you know, people complain about the rules being confusing at times and people varying calls. And I have always been, even in my time in the military, to say, it's easy to complain, but it's harder to pick it up and try to make it better. And that was kind of my attitude that I sat back and I said, well, if not me, then who? Who who was going to step up into the Kentucky coordinator position, to be honest with you? And I didn't really know many people that were as involved in IDPA, especially going across the country to different matches as much as I am. And one of the things that I like about going to other matches in other areas of the country is I bring that flavor back to our home clubs. We will shoot a match and I have match books from all these different matches and we'll have a local match that's a conglomeration of, you know, four or five major matches. And right. I sat back and thought about that. I was like, you know, that can benefit that knowledge. I can bring that to other clubs in Kentucky. And quite frankly, we don't have a lot of clubs. That's the thing I'd like to grow. And I said, well, what better position to be able to do that in as the coordinator. How much traveling are you doing in a year? How And how far are you typically? Uh, what, what's your what's the range? Well, if you go back a few years when they still had uh, indoor nationals, that year I went as far as Sacramento and as far west and as far east as uh, Massachusetts. So, oh, wow. And I think last year I shot 18 matches, 18 sanctioned matches in the year before 16. And this year I'll God. hit about 20. And that's just IDPA. I, I show USPSA majors as well. Wow. Uh, before we get to uh, the pick your poison segment uh, I have planned for you, Rick Denny told me that I needed to ask you about the sock game. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> what's interesting about that is that really, again, two years ago, first sheepdog trials um, down in Florida. It, I will never forget Paul Zima was wearing, he was an SO, and he was wearing, I think, some Don't Tread On Me socks. And they were yellow, and everybody, you know, like, oh, look at these socks. And they were making a big deal out of it. And I was like, you know, that's kind of a neat idea. And this past year, I was out in Vegas with my wife and another couple, and we were in a store, and we just happened to see some socks. They were red socks. and said Taco Cat on it. It was cat. <laughs> And what's funny about the cat thing, and I got cat socks all over the place. I'm not, I don't even like cats. I'm allergic to them. <laughs> but, but they're goofy, strange socks. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start wearing these. And I started wearing them last season. And everywhere I went, people were stopping, taking pictures of my feet and my socks. And it just <laughs> grew and grew and grew. At Nationals last year, I had a, a cat flying through outer space on a shark. Another one, he was on a unicorn with rainbows and a boom box with sunglasses. I mean, and everybody will ask, where do you find these? I'm like, Amazon has everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it, it, it really touched my heart because at Nationals, Rick just turned it around and he made it as a fundraiser. And we actually uh, raised money for the Trinity Rescue Mission. And it, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, so it turned on to something really awesome and it still continues. People still say uh, see it. And there's people all over the country who've contacted me. Hey, I know your socks. I've seen your YouTube videos. I see your <laughs> socks online. And, and it's, it's just started something that's way bigger than me. And it's awesome. That's very cool. All right. So let's play a little pick your poison. So uh, these, are, these are some new questions that I've, I've started asking. You get to choose one or the other based on your own personal preference. And give me an explanation as to why you you know you chose the one you did. So we talked about standards earlier. You talked about that being your first experience with IDPA. Standards first stage or standards last stage of the match? Which would you prefer? Absolutely last stage. <laughs> why? I, it 
if in it, I would differentiate between a standard stage and a starter stage. Mm-hmm. Like a warm up stage could be obviously a lot of them are standard stage, but they're usually like a one target, right? Get you broken in, warmed up. For me, starting with a standard stage is not where I want to be. Uh, typically, they require a lot more mental focus. Mm-hmm. I would rather start with a scenario stage, something that has flexibility, specifically unlimited shooting as well as just maybe the way stages are these days, different ways to shoot it. So mentally, I think there's a little bit more flexibility, whereas your standard stages, even if it's not limited, which 90% of them are, there is, I mean, it is, the whole purpose of it is to test your skills. And why not test my skills after I've been warmed up all day? Right. Um, It's me personally, I've gotten past the, well, I didn't get good until the last stage. No, no, not at all. Or or other people who say, uh, I'm tired by the end of the match. No, for me, I'm usually shooting my best towards the end of the match. Right. Um, I, I try not to aggressively approach a match in the very beginning. Um, I've seen way too many people burn out really fast. Mm. Um, they, they make mistakes and then they get in their mind, okay, I'm down five or I hit an on at my second stage. So now they're working all day to try to make it up. And I learned long ago from some very experienced people that that's a hole that you can't dig out of yourself. So the, the, Steady pace wins the race, not the sprints, typically. Right. And I, I'd rather rather any day have that at the end of a match. Gotcha. Here's a here's a similar question about timing. Mid mid match lunch or a post game meal? Which do you prefer? Oh, I I have been preaching this <laughs> across the country to match directors <laughs> to no avail. I swear there are some great matches out there, like Walking in Memphis, the ones that are at Casa that hold the lunch until the end of the match. Mm-hmm. There is nothing more than a match killer than a gut bust. Right. <laughs> it just, it, it kills the rhythm. It tires your shooters. Um, down in Casa, they, they hold the meal to the end and they put a snack table out, have bananas for guys that like fruit and little snacks and crackers and chips and cookies. Yep. Uh, people that just want a quick rush And it. It is just, it just, it kills a match. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It just, it does. does. There's just no fast way about it. If you, Bring everybody to one shelter to do the food. There's lines. If you pull it out to the bays, now people are just sitting at the bays eating. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work. Um, always, always hold it to the end. I, I wish, I wish, I hope people listen to this. Yep, yep. Kudos to Mike Plato for doing that at Casa. That, that's that's just been great ever since he started doing that, and especially down south where uh, I've noticed Arkansas particularly as the the big barbecue meals. You get one of those big, you know, Southern comfort food meals right in the middle of a match and you just want to lie down and go to sleep. Yeah. And me personally, typically any of those matches, I'll just take a couple bites and throw away the plate. Yep. And then, then, then it's just a wait. Yep. Yep. With all the shooting you're doing, I suspect I know the answer to this one, but are you shooting hand loads or are you shooting factory ammo? Interestingly enough, I am shooting factory. Uh, this, this actually up until this year, I've been shooting mostly freedom munitions. And now I've got an ammo sponsor. So it is custom loaded ammo that, that he's loading, but it is, uh, so I guess you would call that hand loading, but it's not a commercial company. Gotcha. Why shoot factory as opposed to, to loading it yourself? Well, I have got three presses that are sitting down in my basement that have sit and sat there in boxes <laughs> um, that I've bought over the last two years because I just don't have the time. Yeah. Uh, between working full time and traveling like that, like I do for these matches, uh, I'm the kind of person that if I'm going to go at something, I'm going to go all in and I don't feel comfortable jumping into reloading without knowing that I'm going to put that level of focus in it. I want to do it. I I think I'm probably just going to do certain loads. I'd like to start shooting revolver and I might play around with that leave the other ammo that I really shoot and on mass quantities to somebody who's really focusing on it. You shoot all over the country. So this next one, you've, you've probably got plenty of experience to answer this freezing cold or scorching hot. Would you prefer to shoot in 30 degrees or a hundred? Hmm, man, that is actually a tough question. (laughs) I, I think sadly, as much as I dislike extreme heat, I'd probably go with the heat. Um, I, I just recently found out our, this tri-state border, uh, tri-state border disorder that we shot down in Tallahassee last weekend. Yep. While it, while it was 73 degrees in the afternoon, it was thirties in the morning. Ugh. And I, I am at least old enough that my, I do have arthritis in my hands and 
it was very difficult. The first three stages were painful. It was hard to keep your hands uh, relaxed and even warm. So uh, across the match, I, I think, although I'm, I am a firm believer, you can always put more clothes on, but if you're hot, you can't take them all off. So <laughs> right. it, it's, that's what you give up. To me, I need the dexterity to, re- to really shoot and be comfortable doing it. And unfortunately, it's going to be better in the heat than it is in the cold. Now, you've had to do this. So this is an interesting, this will be an interesting question. If you got 16, 16 or 18 stages coming up at Worlds next year, you don't have enough points. Do you go ahead and shoot all 16 or 18 stages in one day? Or do you say, you know what, I'm a little too old for this. I'll wait till next year. I tell everybody, jump in and go for it. I, I've, I've been contacted actually by a number of people and I, I see people post on, on time. Am I going to get in a uh, you know, world? It's worlds this year. How many points do I need to get in? And I tell people all the time, you can get in with no points. There's always people who sign up and jo- drop out. Last year, I'm pretty sure everyone who was on the wait list got in. And many of those folks had single digit um, points and they got to shoot on Friday, Saturday, where if they would have gotten in at the beginning, they would have had to shoot it all day Thursday. So now, I, I tell people all the time, jump in. I mean, if you obviously seriously start shooting it and it's too much for you, you can always buy out, bow out, but you still had the experience of sitting at and shooting the Worlds or, or National Championship. Absolutely. Yep. All right, last one before we get to the final question. Which which rule change had the biggest impact on, on your game? The one point per second change or the ability to reload in the open? Yeah, I was hoping you were going to pick another rule. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> Um, I would probably say the one second per point down, um, because when I started, although it, it's funny, I've gone back and looked at a number of my scores and I was shooting more accurate than I thought. In general, I, I sit back and say, well, I was less accurate when I started shooting. It's not necessarily the case, mm-hmm. um, but I think from an effect on my game, making sure that I do focus on accuracy as a result, that that one second per point down, you know, requires it. Without it, you're you're never going to make it. As we wrap this up, final question: What is it about IDPA that has taken you from the rainy, you know, first local match shooting a classifier as a as a novice to master class to safety officer to state coordinator to traveling to 18 to 20 matches around the country every year. What is it about this sport that you love so much that makes you, that keeps you coming back? I will tell you, it's the same thing that kept me in the United States Navy. It's the people, you know, I I used to preach it all the time in the Navy that the Navy wasn't the Navy without the people in the Navy because the Navy was cold and, and heartless. It's just rules and regulations. But what, what makes the Navy is the passion of the people that are in it. And that's what draws me to IDPA. Um, we can all complain about it. We can all dislike certain rules, but matches don't happen without volunteers. They don't happen without match directors. And I have thoroughly in my heart enjoyed traveling across the country and meeting hundreds of people. I have run into people last year in Wisconsin. I ran up to, ran, I I was on a stage and I had somebody come up to me. He goes, Aaron, right? With the sock. And I'm like, (laughs) um, yeah, he's like, um, and this is honestly, I've had this at least two, three times. He, he said, you know, I watch your YouTube video. I started IDPA, student IDPA, and I, you have so many videos. I didn't even know what a match looked like. And I, I've, I learned what IDPA was watching your video. And I mean, I, I mean, it just choked me up. I'm like, wow, really? I mean, thank you. You know, shake my hand. He goes, man, I'm going to watch all your videos. <laughs> and, you know, hey, I, I'm not some top shooter. You know, I, I need to go get in, instruction. Uh, last year I had to... Go take some some in sh- in classes, uh, you know, from Elias Frangoulis, and he, you know, here's here's a top level IPSC world champion, and I I've got to go get training. I'm, you know, people look at me and say, "Wow, you're you're where you're at," and I'm like, "No, man, I'm still growing, I'm still learning." I, and if I'm not humble about that, if I'm not trying to help people, it's just not it's just not worth it anymore. And I think I found that camaraderie that I had in the military across IDPA. People helping people, people loaning each other equipment, people willing to help teach each other. Um, that's when I see people get angry and bitter and argue about rules. I, I try to tell people to step back, man. Look, look at the big picture of why you're here. We're all here to have fun, enjoy the sport, grow it, 
you know, protect our Second Amendment rights and really learn from it. And, and that's what I really, truly enjoy. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for everything you're doing for the sport. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your service to our country. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, an opportunity to squad with you. I think we're actually going to, to shoot a match together later this year. So I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face. Awesome. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to hearing all your other podcasts this year. All right. Thank you. All right. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our guests for coming on the show and our sponsors for making all of this possible. Take a moment, if you would, to check out the website, check out our show notes at unloadpodcast.com. We've got lots of interviews with more amazing guests like the one you heard today. Join our Facebook group at unloadpodcast.com slash Facebook for all the latest updates and to connect with other fans of the show. And if you'd like to support the show, we sure would appreciate it. Consider becoming a patron at unloadpodcast.com slash extra. I've got some full-length interviews and special content available there exclusively for patrons as well. And if you know somebody or you yourself would make an interesting guest for a future episode of Unload and Show Clear, please contact me at lloyd at unloadpodcast.com or click on the contact page on the website and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Tune in again next time for another episode of Unload and Show Clear.